All right. In this section, we're going to look at the graphs of tangent and cotangent functions. So in order to motivate these graphs, let's recall that tangent is sine over cosine, and we will use what we know about the graphs of sine and cosine in order to generate the graph for tangent and cotangent. All right, so we know sine takes on this particular pattern with a sinusoidal wave. And we know that the default period for y equals sine of x is 2 pi, which means this unit out here is 2 pi. This is pi, this is pi over 2, and this is 3 pi over 2. And this is one period of sine, but let's also draw a few more periods of it. How about over on this side? All right, so we have two periods of sine drawn, and let's just note that this continues on forever in both directions. Okay, very good. Now, before we do get into the graph of tangent, let's just note something interesting here. The x-axis contains the angles, and the y-axis is the ratios, meaning the sine of those angles. So, for instance, from zero to pi over two, these angles here represent first quadrant angles on the unit circle. Of course, sine values are positive in the first quadrant, so we have our graph above the x-axis positive. Angles between pi over 2 and pi we know correspond to second quadrant angles, and in the second quadrant, sine is positive, and we know that, and of course it's positive here. Third quadrant angles are between pi and 3 pi over 2, and in the third quadrant, we know sine is negative. Ah, well, this agrees with our graph because the graph of sine is below the axis. And same with fourth quadrant here. And then we're back to the first quadrant where sine ratios are positive. And even if you look over here, we have angles between negative pi over two and zero, which as negative angles, these are fourth quadrant angles here. And in the fourth quadrant, sine is negative and then this over here would be the third quadrant, where sine is negative. Continuing on, we now have angles in the second quadrant and angles in the first quadrant, which are positive for sine. So you can quickly see that the positive and negative of the graph corresponds with where, with what quadrants we expect a function to output positive and negative values. Okay, well, let's remember that fact for a little later. In order to graph the tangent, we're also going to need to know the cosine values, of course. So let's graph cosine as well while we're here. And let's graph it on the same set of axes here. So we know cosine makes a pattern like this, kind of a V shape, although it's no longer a V once you draw the sinusoidal curve. Uh, it's probably a good idea to label these graphs now that we have two of them. So this is cosine of x, and the dark blue one is sine of x. So of course, we are interested in tangent of x, which is going to be the sine of x graph divided by the cosine of x graph, right? That, that should magically produce the graph of tangent. And for that matter, when we get to cotangent, it's the other way around. It'll be cosine divided by sine. So let's begin to generate what we think might be a tangent graph. And to do that, let's graph some axes right below. So this is going to contain our graph of tangent. Okay, so since tangent is sine divided by cosine, we can see that everywhere sine of x is equal to zero, tangent of x will also equal zero because tangent of x will be zero divided by, who cares, right? Zero divided by whatever is zero. So we can right away take all of the x-intercepts of the sine function and copy them down and they're going to be the same x-intercepts of tangent. So we know that sine has an x-intercept at zero, pi, two pi, three pi, four pi, five pi, all the multiples of pi including the negative multiples, so negative pi, negative 2 pi, negative 58 pi. So sine of all of those multiples of pi are going to be 0, which means that's the same for tangent. 
tangent of pi is 0, tangent of 2 pi is 0, tangent of 3 pi is 0, etc. Okay, so whatever the graph of tangent turns out to be, it'll go through those x-intercepts. Now, what about this cosine in the denominator? Well, this tells us something very interesting. Everywhere cosine is equal to 0, it doesn't matter what sine is, Every, everywhere cosine is equal to 0, tangent's going to be undefined because tangent will be, whatever sine is, divided by 0. Not allowed. So we now look at the cosine graph, and everywhere it's equal to 0, which are the odd multiples of pi over 2, we're going to have tangent undefined. And that's going to manifest as sort of a series of vertical asymptotes here. So these are all the places where cosine is equal to 0. In other words, the x-intercepts of cosine will correspond to vertical asymptotes of the tangent function. All right. Now, our awareness of the locations of these vertical asymptotes and these x-intercepts is enough for us to get a very accurate sketch of the tangent graph. For example, if we know that tangent goes through the origin, which it does, and we know that it's asymptotic to the vertical line here, x equal pi over 2, then it's either forced to come up like this and be asymptotic, or it's forced to come down like this. There's really no other choice. So it's one of those. Of course, it can't be both, because we would fail the vertical line test. So this is where the conversation on quadrants from earlier is really going to help. 0 to pi over 2 corresponds to the first quadrant. Ah, well, all functions are positive there. So that rules out the bottom part, and we know that the graph of tangent is going to look like this. OK. In the second quadrant, which is angles between pi over 2 and pi, we know tangent is negative, which means the graph of tangent, which is forced to go through this x-intercept and approach this asymptote, must do so in a negative manner. So it's going to do it below the axis downward. In the third quadrant, pi to 3 pi over 2, well, we know tangent's positive in the third quadrant. So this is going to continue up in the positive direction. In the fourth quadrant, tangent is negative. So this is going to drop down like this. And we, if we continued it, it would continue upward like this, asymptotically. Um, so you can probably get a sense of what the graph of tangent is really going to look like at this point. Over here, negative pi over 2 to 0, that's the fourth quadrant again, and tangent values are negative. So this is going to drop down and be asymptotic in a downward direction. Now this pattern is just going to continue to repeat itself. So we get these sort of vertical swooshes for tangent. And there's just an infinite number of these vertical swooshes. And that is the graph of tangent. OK, so let's write down some information about it. Like, what's the domain? Well, the domain of cosine and sine is all real numbers, and that was very easy. The domain of tangents, definitely not all real numbers. It's undefined at all of its vertical asymptotes. In other words, it's undefined when cosine is equal to 0 or it's undefined at all the odd multiples of pi over 2. So what we're going to say is that the domain is x such that x is not an odd multiple of pi over 2. And remember, this n is an element of an integers. OK, what's the range of the tangent function? Again, if we look at cosine and sine, we remember those ranges are negative 1 to 1. Those are the possible outputs of the function. Ah, but tangent can actually output anything. So its range 
This time, this is really easy. It's negative infinity to positive infinity. Okay, well, what's the period of the tangent function? So the period is this horizontal length, basically between one part of a vertical swoosh and the adjacent part. So the easiest way to, to determine the period is just to look right on the x-axis between two adjacent x-intercepts. We have a period here of pi. So this distance is pi. There we are. Okay, notice that that's half as long as the period for sine and cosine, which are each 2 pi. And finally, let's note that tangent has the same kind of symmetry that sine does. It goes through the origin, which means that we have this identity. Tangent of negative x is equal to negative tangent of x. So in other words, tangent is an odd function, much like sine was. All right, so that's kind of a neat graph. Uh, let's find the graph for cotangent now. Okay, so to find the graph of cotangent of x, let's recall that cotangent is the reciprocal of tangent, or cosine over sine. So let's summon up the graphs of cosine and sine once again, and this time we'll basically apply the same reasoning we did before, and we'll establish the graph for cotangent. All right, there's our graph of cosine and sine, so let's draw some axes. All right, very good. So if we follow the same reasoning that we did earlier, we know that the numerator of this fraction, which is cosine of x, whenever cosine is equal to zero, so will cotangent will also be zero. So let's look at the graph of cosine and see everywhere that it's zero, which are the odd multiples of pi over two. And those will correspond to the x-intercepts of the cotangent graph. So we know whatever the cotangent graph is doing, it's going to go through those x-intercepts right there. Now, again, looking at this fraction, we can see that whenever sine of x is equal to zero, we're going to get stuff over zero, and that's undefined. So cotangent will be undefined wherever sine of x is equal to zero. So let's see where sine of x is equal to zero, and we have that problem right at the origin, and at pi, and 2 pi, and negative pi, and negative 2 pi, so all the multiples of pi, and cotangent will manifest that undefined area as a vertical asymptote. So everywhere sine of x has an x-intercept, i.e. everywhere it's zero, will mean that cotangent of x has a vertical asymptote. So that occurs at all of the multiples of pi. Okay, uh, what we're going to see is that the graph for cotangent is strikingly similar to the graph for tangent uh, with a few modifications. First of all, the graph for tangent goes right through the origin, and that certainly will not be the case for cotangent because cotangent's not even defined at zero. However, it's going to look like vertical swooshy things, just like the graph of tangent. So let's take a look at the first quadrant. Well, we know that the graph has to interact with this x-intercept and this vertical asymptote, which means that either we're going to go up like that or we're going to go down like this. And again, it's not both of them, it's only one of those. And the way we're going to figure out which one is by looking at the first quadrant and saying, well, is cotangent positive or negative in the first quadrant? Ah, well, everything's positive in the first quadrant. So that means we can't have that one. It must mean that our graph is doing this. Okay, and in the second quadrant, cotangent is negative. So this is going to continue, and it must act like so. In the third quadrant, angles between pi and 3 pi over 2, cotangent is positive. So again, we're above the axis, which means the graph must take on this shape. And in the fourth quadrant, we're negative again. 
cotangent values are below the x-axis, like this. So again, you can see quite clearly we have this infinite pattern of vertical swooshy things, and we're just going to continue that pattern until we're off the page. All right, and this continues infinitely. So there'll be an asymptote here, and there'll be like part of an asymptote there, and so on. So this is the graph of cotangent. Again, notice that it's offset from the graph of tangent, which goes through the origin, and also the tangent graph, as you read it from left to right, the tangent graph kind of increases, right? The, the swooshes sort of work their way to the top right, and the cotangent graph, the swooshes kind of go downhill as you read from left to right, meaning they start at the top left and work their way to the bottom right. Okay, let's write down a few facts about the graph of cotangent. So what is the domain? Well, the domain would be the set of all x values except where sine of x is equal to zero. So we're going to omit everywhere sine of x is equal to zero. That would be all the multiples of pi, because we know sine of any multiple of pi is zero. So in other words, we're going to say the domain is all x values such that x is not equal to a multiple of pi. Okay, what's the range? Uh, well, we can see that the range, that's the set of possible outputs of a cotangent, we can see that that range is all real numbers, negative infinity to positive infinity. And what is the period? The period is the horizontal distance between two corresponding parts of this swoosh thing, and we can see that that distance is a distance of pi. So it's the distance between these two points, for instance. Those two points are pi apart, so this has a period of pi. And like tangent, cotangent is an odd function, so we have this identity. Cotangent of negative x is equal to negative cotangent of x. All right, so for the rest of this lecture, we're going to be graphing tangent and cotangent graphs, but with some minor embellishments to their period and their vertical stretch. All right, let's talk about two parameters on the graph of tangent and the graph of cotangent that influence the shape of those graphs. All right, so the coefficient of the trig function, a in this case, will have pretty much exactly the same role that the a does as a coefficient of sine or cosine. Now, I'm avoiding the use of amplitude here, but you can think of it as amplitude. Uh, strictly speaking, amplitude is not the correct word because these are not actual waves, the way sine and cosine are waves. But they have the same effect in the sense that they influence the vertical stretch of the graph. The b, which is the coefficient of x within the tangent or cotangent function, they have the influence over the horizontal stretch, or the period. And it is still correct to use the word period here because these are periodic functions, meaning they repeat the behavior uh, left and right. So for sine and cosine, you may recall that the period was calculated as 2 pi divided by b, and that's because the default period for sine or cosine was 2 pi. For tangent and cotangent, the default period is simply pi, which means that the period for tangent of bx or cotangent of bx will be pi divided by b, not 2 pi divided by b. All right, let's get into some examples. Okay, so here we're going to graph y equal 3 times tangent of x. So let's extract some information. So let's start with the vertical stretch, which essentially was the amplitude before. The vertical stretch is going to be the absolute value of a in this case, so that's going to be 3. And the period will be pi divided by 
b. So in this case, pi divided by the coefficient of x, which is 1. So that's pi. That's the default period for tangent. Now, we're going to see that as long as you understand the basic shape of tangent and cotangent, uh, graphing them even with these embellishments is a very straightforward process. We just need to know how to label the axes. So for tangent, we know the shape of the tangent graph is going to look like this. It would be some kind of asymptote here and some kind of asymptote here. We know tangent goes through the origin and it's an increasing function from left to right, so it'll be oriented this way. All we have to do is label the axes. Well, this particular function has a period of pi, and we know that the period is split evenly from negative some quantity to positive some quantity in this case. So that means that this particular distance is going to be half of the period. So this distance is pi over two. And that means over here we have negative pi over two. Okay, well, how do we accommodate for the vertical stretch? Can we just put any point over here and say that's three? Uh, well, not exactly, but close. What we have to do is locate halfway between zero and pi over two, which is right here, and we go up until we hit the graph, and that will be the value of our vertical stretch, which means we have no choice but to put the three right there. And correspondingly, if we locate the halfway point on the other side, and we hit our function, that's going to be negative three. So there is one period of three tangent x. Great, if we wanted a second period, we would just continue to tick. Clearly we have an increment value of pi over two, so this is pi over two, two pi over two, and three pi over two. And there we are. There's our graph of y equal three tangent of x. Okay, so here we're gonna graph y equals tangent of x over four. Uh, again, let's write down some information. We have a vertical stretch of the absolute value of the coefficient of the function. So absolute value of one is one. And here we have a period of, again, it's pi divided by b. So the coefficient of x here is one fourth, because x over four is like one fourth x. So this is pi divided by one fourth, which gives a period of four pi. Okay, excellent. Uh, we know that tangent takes on this shape here. So it's just a matter of labeling our axes. Okay, let's start with the y-axis. If we go halfway over this way, and we hit our function, it's about there, cross over this way, this is gonna be our vertical stretch. So that's a one, and correspondingly over here, negative one. Okay, but what about our x-axis scale? Well, again, we know that this entire period is four pi, so half of that length is two pi, which means that this is a value of two pi, and this is a value of negative two pi. Simple as that. If we want another period of this thing, we'll just go out this way, a couple more ticks. So two pi, this'll be four pi, this'll be six pi, and that's the location of our next asymptote. And there we are. Now we have two periods of tangent of x over four drawn. Okay, in this example, we're gonna sketch negative two times the tangent of five x. So here we have both embellishments to worry about, as well as the fact that this coefficient is negative. And what that means is that the tangent graph will be vertically reflected. So it'll swoosh downward, kind of like a cotangent graph. Okay, well, let's write down our information. Vertical stretch, which is sort of like the amplitude, is the absolute value of that coefficient. So that's two. And the period will be pi divided by the coefficient of x, which in this case will be five. All right, and with that, we can go right into our graph. Okay, so we know there'll be an asymptote right here, and there'll be an asymptote right here. 
and we know our graph is going to be upside down relative to the normal tangent graph, so it's sort of, as you read from left to right, it's swooshing downward. Still goes through the origin, of course. It's just flipped vertically. So all we have to do is label the axes. All right, let's start with the y-axis. So if we go halfway along here, corresponds to this point, and we know that there's a vertical stretch of two, so this is a two right here. And correspondingly over here, that's a y value of negative two. So all we have to do is label the x-axis. Okay, well, this entire length here is the period, which is pi over five. So half of that, this length right here, would be pi over 10. It's half of pi over five. So that's pi over 10. And over here, we have negative pi over 10. Simple as that. Let's draw another period. Ah, let's put one over on this side for once. So our increment value is clearly pi over 10. So we're subtracting pi over 10. This gets us negative two pi over 10 and negative three pi over 10. And yes, you should be reducing those fractions. Okay, so we're just gonna draw another one of these things. Quick tip, as you're drawing those, always start from the middle. It's, unless you're really practiced at this, it's very hard to draw it starting from one asymptote and drawing to the other. So start from the middle and draw one coming out and go back to the middle and draw one coming down. Okay, so we have two periods of this particular function drawn. So we win. Ah, okay. Now we have a cotangent graph to worry about. So, well, it's pretty much just as straightforward as graphing a tangent. We will extract the information we need. Vertical stretch, which is the absolute value of the coefficient of the function. Absolute value of six is a six. And the period, which is pi divided by the coefficient of x. So that would be pi divided by two. All right, now if we're graphing tangent, we know what to do. We obviously would put two asymptotes here and here, but recall that cotangent's a little bit different. Its default shape is actually completely to the right of the y-axis, and the y-axis itself is an asymptote with the second asymptote over here. And cotangent is by default decreasing as you read from left to right. So since this is a positive coefficient, we don't need to reflect it vertically. So we know that it's going to take on this shape like this. Okay, so it's just a matter of labeling our axes. All right, we'll start with the y-axis. So if we go halfway out and we hit our function, oh, this time it's about that far. So that's gonna be our six. And if we go halfway between the other two and we go down, that's gonna be about our negative six. Okay, and now we just need to label the x-axis. Well, we have a period of pi over two, and the period is exactly this distance, which means literally this coordinate here must be pi over two. Okay, so this one is half of that, which is pi over four. So we have a step value of pi over four. And there we are. Let's draw another period of this thing. So we're just gonna count out by pi over four. Pi over four. 2 pi over 4, this will be 3 pi over 4, and 4 pi over 4, which is pi. Okay, hey, let's draw a third period just for fun. So we'll go out this way, negative pi over 4, negative pi over 2. Okay, and there we have our graph, y equals 6 cotangent of 2x.